1996. Grandmaster Garry Kasparov's eyes are watery. What just happened is a symbol of computer calculation supremacy. For the first time, a computer defeated the best human chess player in the world in a single chess match. IBM's Deep Blue needed another year and a refurbish to complete the Russian genius tragedy. It was chess predicting the computer revolution that will come in the next few years. With Kasparov's defeat, the golden age of chess in the 20th century came to an end. In the next years, the once worldwide respected ancient game marched to oblivion. But while 2020 could be remembered for a slew of terrible things, it can also be remembered for something more uplifting. The return of chess. How did it happen? Welcome to Intrigued Mind and join us today on a journey through the history of one of the most exciting games ever created. Children's play is the safest way to learn and understand the world. It is a way to test our bodies and learn from our environment, safe from threats like puppies that fight each other without harming themselves, while gaining survival skills. But the more knowledge we acquire, the more complicated it becomes to have fun. Games are the ultimate expression of this instinct. We create structures and rules to measure our skills and compete in a creative environment. Games are present in all cultures. Attested to as early as 2600 BC, the royal game of Ur, Senet and Mankala are some of the oldest known games. There are legends about chess origins related to the Chinese military in 200 BC as a metaphor of a battlefield. A more accepted history takes us to the 7th century, specifically to the Gupta Empire, in what we know today as India. Supposedly, a young prince created a game to honor his brother's death in a battle. Using an Ash Tabada board based on other games, he created one with a unique feature. Four pieces with a different name, shape and movement. Among them a special one, the king. The winner would be the one who first left the opponent's piece without means of escape. This game was called Chataronga. After conquering the Gupta Empire, the Persians learned the game and expanded it among their people. It was here that it took the name of Shah or king, from which the English word chess comes. When the Persian matches were over, the expression shamat or the king is helpless was used by winners, giving rise to the modern checkmate. The conquest of Persia brought the game to the great Islamic caliphate, introducing it to the Arab world. The reigning caliphs became avid players, transforming it into a symbol of intelligence and creativity. In Europe, the original Indian military units consisting of footmen, infantry elephants, chariots and cavalry became the modern pawns, bishops, rooks and kings. A curious fact is the word alfil still used in Spanish for the peace bishop. This translation is not literal, but a term from Arabic, which means elephant. The popular European variation in the 17th century is the basis for modern chess, which introduced a fundamental change in the new dynamic of the game, the queen. Until then, the piece that accompanied the king was known as the advisor, both with similar moves. It is believed that the powerful Isabella of Spain and Elizabeth I of England inspired the transformation of the piece, the advisor, into the queen. The queen had another significant new feature, the most potent range of moves in the game. This meant that the matches were much shorter, which prompted its massive growth in the Enlightenment years. The game was no longer only known in the royal courts, but also in the coffee shops. In the 19th century, chess tournaments became more and more numerous, and the first organizations that developed a formal structure for the international competition were founded. After the Second World War, modern chess reached all over the world. 
Grand Masters were celebrities admired as symbols of virtue. They were bearers of skills considered among the highest expressions of the human mind. This prestige made the game and the best players a matter of interest to a geopolitical conflict that shaped the second half of the 20th century. The Cold War. The United States and the Soviet Union made significant efforts to promote the game among their people. From both powers emerged several grandmasters, and the geniuses who disputed the title of world champion. The International Chess Federation regulated a fierce competition that was settled in championships spread all over the world. Mostly Soviet players dominated the golden age of chess. Mikhail Botvinnik was the first world champion of this era. Succeeded by Vasily Smyslov, Mikhail Tal, Tigran Petrosian, and the legendary Boris Spatsky. In the middle of the reign of Spatsky, a genius threatened the Soviet hegemony, Bobby Fischer. Charismatic and exceptionally intelligent, both players starred in the most famous rivalry in the history of the game. Their duel for the World Championship was called the Game of the Century. In August 1972, the Democratic Party held its national meeting live on television in the middle of the presidential campaign in which President Nixon was seeking re-election. The phones of New York, WNET, Channel 13 collapsed with calls. Furious viewers demanded to resume the broadcast of a World Chess Championship. The presidential campaign didn't matter. People didn't want to miss a minute of countless hours of playtime between Fischer and Spassky. Fischer's victory in the middle of the Cold War was the pinnacle of chess popularity. From that moment, the interest in the game went down, especially after the end of the Cold War. The only duel that would again attract the public and media attention at a comparable level was Garry Kasparov versus the IBM computer Deep Blue in 1996 and 1997. The computer designed by IBM to overcome the man, considered the best of all time, won in a match full of symbolism. Computers have come into our lives to stay, and chess began an austere era of development in smaller communities of followers. FIDE's disastrous management led by Russian politician Kurzan Ilyimzhinov made the loss of interest in chess more acute. He was accused by grandmasters of corruption and ineptitude, making headlines for his ties to Saddam Hussein and Muammar Gaddafi. The rise of the internet and online chess was one of the few events that encouraged its popularity in the following years. However, the unforgettable year 2020 brought two events that have already generated a renewed interest in the game. The highly successful Netflix, Queen's Gambit series, and the coronavirus. As happened century years ago with the Black Death and smallpox, chess has once again become one of the ways chosen by many people to deal with confinement and quarantine. Since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic in March 2020, the prominent players in the online chess communities have increased their social network presence. Everything that generates relief from stress of confinement has grown during the pandemic. The ability to use the internet to connect with players worldwide has revived interest in the game. The most visited site globally is chess.com. In less than a month, they have 700,000 new members, and the number of daily games played exceeded 9 million. The growth was so explosive that the servers had to be adjusted and the staff expanded. This explosion of players has even impacted the Grand Masters, who are generating more interest and interactions and producing more content. Platforms such as Twitch have been the technological support of choice. It might sound a little weird that chess streaming has a community, but it really does says Daniel Naraditsky, a grandmaster who broadcasts games on Twitch multiple times a week. Many experts believe that the grandmaster's austere and silent profile in the 21st century has been a factor in the lack of interest in chess. 
Nick Barton, the director of business development for Chess.com, views the rise of top players streaming as a phenomena that may be decisive for a resurgence of the interest of the game. Grandmasters like Hikari Nakaruma not only share their games, but interact with the community on a personal level. This attracts the attention of a new generation of players looking for a social experience beyond the board's mastery. Alexandra Botes has long been an advocate of women in chess, and she has been struck by the number of new female players and content producers she's connected with over the past few months. This resurgence has a second impetus, perhaps as relevant as the pandemic itself. The Netflix Queen's Gambit miniseries has made chess visible again beyond the player community. The drama tells the fictional tale of Elizabeth Harmon, a brilliant American player in a markedly male-dominated golden age of chess. The show shocked audiences worldwide and is now the most successful in Netflix history. The series shows with beauty the struggle of a genius against her traumas, addictions and macho society. And above all, it describes her irrepressible love for the game and her endless quest for excellence. Wrote Boccaccio, If you take my advice, you will find pastime for the hot hours before us, not in play, in which the loser must needs to be vexed and neither the winner nor the onlooker much the better pleased, but in telling of stories in which the invention of one may afford solace to all in the company of his hearers. It's hard to find better words to describe what chess meant for generations of players for almost 1,500 years. It may be more or less popular at different times in history, but its seductive complexity has proven to transcend the passage of time. It's a metaphor for the human mind with a beauty beyond cultures and ages. For more videos on the most amazing forgotten parts of history, be sure to subscribe to the Intrigued Mind channel, like the video and leave your suggestions in the comments below.